Amen. All right, let's get loud with praise for the Lord. All right, today is going to be a little bit different. We're starting a, a brand new series. We're starting a brand new series. There we go. <laughs> uh, can, can I just get your permission a little bit? I'm going to do this a couple times today. Hey, can we just kind of talk about life a little bit? Like, <laughs> no? Okay, let's all go home. If I was to say to you, man, um, there's something that you just need to break. Like, there's a pattern in your life that you need to break. We would all, in our culture, kind of understand what that means. It means that there's something that's going on, um, it's not good, and we need, to, uh, we need to fight against that. We need to break that pattern, that habit, or break that cycle that we have in our life. And actually, this is what we're going to be talking about as we go through the series. The series, that obviously, as you see on the screen, is called Break the Cycle. Now, here's the thing, though. Not all cycles in life are bad. Listen, let's be real. Our lives are full of all kinds of different cycles, and some of them are good. Um, if you remember your schooling, you could think about, like, the water cycle, right? Rains come down, fills the lakes, the ocean, the ponds, sun comes out. All of a sudden, all the water goes back up into the clouds, up into the sky, so that it comes down and rain again. I'm pretty sure we're all very thankful for the fact that we have the water cycle and we get to drink water, right? Or how about this one? There's the, I don't know if you know this, but the circle of life. The circle of life really is a, a cycle that we have, right? The, um, the, the big lion is the, the king of the jungle. The lion eats the gazelle. Um, but eventually what happens, the lion dies. The lion disintegrates, goes into the dirt, nourishes the grass. The gazelle eats what? grass, right? So it's the, the circle or the cycle of life. Now that one may not be as scientific as more as it is of me directing you to the Lion King movie, right? The circle of life, yeah. Um, but that cycle is there and as we go through this series and especially today, we're really going to be taking a look at how we can break some cycles in our life. Before we go too far though, let me just stop and say good morning. Welcome to Harvest Bible Chapel, North Iowa. Uh, for all of our visitors, my name is Pastor Terry, and whether you're joining us online or here in person, we really do love that you are here to worship with us. If for some reason I haven't met you yet, I will be out in our lobby in the welcome area after the service. Please come introduce yourself. I'd love to get a chance to meet you, even if you're wearing a Chiefs jersey on the day they play the Vikings. It's okay. I still want to get a chance to meet you. Amen. Okay? Um, but let's go ahead and do what we do every week and open up our, our Bibles. Turn, if you would, to the book of Isaiah. We're going to be in chapter 1. And I want to catch you all up a little bit, especially for those of you who may be visitors. We just finished a series in Ephesians entitled New. We went verse by verse through the book of Ephesians. And now, uh, by the way, that, um, that walk through Ephesians, all six chapters of it, took us about 30 weeks. Now we're starting a brand new series in the book of Isaiah that has 66 chapters and like 24 verses. So basically, we're going to be in this book until I retire or die, whichever one comes first. Uh, no, I'm joking. This is going to be more of a survey series. The series will take us up through Christmas. Um, but I want to stop and talk just a minute um, about why we're talking about break the cycle. So here's the thing. Um, it's really hard to kind of catch a book like Isaiah in about six weeks. And it's hard because, man, there's some great stuff in the book of Isaiah. There's, um, there's all kinds of power. There's warnings. There's consequences. There's judgment. But then there's this great hope. This, uh, this great promise of redemption and being redeemed as a people, um, it's exciting. There's so much richness. There's all kinds of prophecy, prophecy future, prophecy about things that um, have actually already happened now, things that are happening and things that will happen, to come, uh, that will, um, happen as we move forward in life. But the series is entitled Break the Cycle because... Through this book, Israel is in this consistent 
cycle that they have had throughout their history. And it's not a great one. I want you to take a look here. I told, pulled this off of the, the Bible Project. That's a, um, a Bible Project is an organization that does videos about different books. You can find them on YouTube. Um, most of them are great. I would highly recommend them. But this is uh, a cycle of sin that Israel had itself in. Now, we can see it all throughout the Old Testament, but um, it's especially prevalent kind of in the book of Judges. And here's this cycle that we see the nation of Israel falling into all the time. It really actually kind of starts with God's promises of peacetime and things going well. But you know how it is. Sometimes when things are going well, we kind of don't pay as much attention to um, the things of God because we forget, right? Everything's going well. Um, But then what would happen is Israel would drift into sin. They would drift away from the things of God. They would actually drift towards the, the gods of other nations and they would fall into sin like idol worship. And then because of their sin, they would get this period of time where they were under oppression. And that's actually what's happening as we jump into the book of Isaiah. Israel is already in this period of oppression. Um, They're not completely out in, uh, they haven't been completely taken into other lands in captivity, but they are facing the oppression of other people, groups coming into their land. And so what happens as we see through this cycle for them, is they finally turn in repentance back to God. And when they turn in repentance back to God, then God will eventually deliver them and take them back into the, the time of peace. And so this time for, that Isaiah is speaking, and Isaiah, by the way, is speaking mostly to the area of Judah, which was where Jerusalem was, okay? Um, In time and history, the nation of Israel split into two nations. The northern kingdom was uh, Ephraim or or Israel. The southern kingdom was Judah. And again, that's where Jerusalem was. So Isaiah is bringing the word of God. Isaiah is what we call as a prophet. A prophet is, is just someone that God uses to speak to the people. And as you're turning, if you haven't found it yet, Isaiah is in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is the first 39 books of the Bible. It's the the time from the beginning of creation up until the time when Christ comes onto earth. And the New Testament is like Christ forward, right? So you'll find the book of Isaiah between Song of Solomon and Jeremiah. And we're going to be here for quite a few weeks. And I want to take a second and I want to just read the intro as we go through. It says this, the first verse says this. It says, the vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which, is, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the days of Uzziah, was a, these are kings, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Again, Isaiah is a prophet. He is um, sent by God to go out and speak to the people. Now, in the Old Testament, God would actually speak directly to prophets, and give them commands and instructions of what to go tell the people. Sometimes he would speak to them in a vision like we see here. And so this is what we're getting. God has given Isaiah a vision of what he is supposed to go and speak to his people, um, the nation of Judah, the, the Israelites of the time. The book is full of God's pleas, his warnings, his judgment, also hope of a of a great revelation, of great redemption, and I want you to just hear as we go through this, even in the verses that we see, God, through Isaiah, just pleading for his people, pleading for his people, and it shows us what great love he has for his people then, and the love that he still has for us today. So, Keep that in mind as we go forward. Let me just stop. Why is this important? Like, why is it important to go through this series called Breaking or Break the Cycle? And again, can I just want to get your permission? I want to stop for a minute. I just want to take off my my preacher's hat, which uh, is normally what I tend to wear up here, and I want to put on my pastor's hat. Can I get your permission for that? Yes? Give me a head nod, something. If you shook your head no, I was going to do it anyway. There's a couple of things that pastors can do from the pulpit. Typically what we do is we preach. We bring the word of God to you, right? But also there's moments where you got to stop and take some preaching, like just explaining what the Old Testament is, because not everybody grew up in church. But there's also pastoring. 
And pastoring is hard to do from the pulpit. It's, it's the reason why after all of my messages, I try to give you something practical to do, right? Pastoring is much easier one-on-one, and it's um, something you can kind of work through something with a person in their life. But there's something that is so been on my heart that I wanted to just take like a whole series and try to pastor everybody all at once. And it's this issue of breaking the cycles of sin in our lives. We all have different cycles in our lives, right? Every one of us, I bet, can find something that's a struggle, some unhealthy pattern that we keep coming back to over and over again, like it's beating us down, like it's got this grip on us that we can't get rid of. And man, if we can break these types of cycles in my life, hear this, please hear my heart. If you can identify and break these cycles in your life, it can so quickly and so powerfully change your presence, and also it has all those promises of blessings in the future, the blessings that for sure we will receive, if not now, in eternity. Are you with me? So this has been my heart as I've been thinking through what is it that we're going to do, and I know that's a really long intro, and now that I have bored some of you with the mushy stuff, um, and hopefully got some of your attention with the rest of it, I want to just stop again. The main point for this series, but specifically for today, is this. Break the cycles of sin in your life. Now this text, as we jump into Isaiah, Isaiah comes out uh, fully loaded. He's not pulling any punches. God has given him some charges, and Isaiah is acting almost as the prosecuting attorney who is bringing these charges against Israel. You can picture it as a court scene. And so God is coming at the people, and he's coming at them with a great strength. So as we go through today, there's actually uh, five things that I want you to see about these charges that, um, that God is bringing through Isaiah Right? There's five R's in particular. So if you're ready to run forward, say, let's run. All right, let's do it. So here's the first one. And we are covering a bunch of text today. So please follow along with me. It won't be up on the screen because it doesn't fit. But starting off in verse 1 again, it says, the, ver- the vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. It goes on to say this. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. Right there, that's a, oh, we better pay attention moment, right? Always when we bring the word of God, the Lord has spoken. But when it says it specifically, we should pay attention. For the Lord has spoken. Children I have reared and brought up. Aw. Do it with me. Aw. Children I have reared and I've brought them up, right? Right? But they have rebelled against me. Okay, I know for those of you who are parents, you kind of get this feeling, right? But they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner and the donkey its master's crib. But Israel does not know. My people do not understand. A sinful nation. A people. Catch that Ah, Again, here's where we're hearing the plea. The plea of God. A sinful nation. A people laden with iniquity. Offspring of evildoers, children who deal corruptly. They have forsaken the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They are utterly estranged. Here's the first thing that we need to do, right? As we're dealing with these charges. And my question, I'll start off with this, is what kind of charges could God bring against you? What are some of those cycles of sin or unhealthy patterns that you might have in your life? Keep that in mind as we go through. As we face these, the first thing that we need to do is we need to recognize the cycle. Isaiah starts off, he doesn't pull any punches, he comes full force and he lays the charges out so that the nation of Israel, the people, will understand exactly what it is that God is bringing against them. And there's actually three different groups that these charges are brought against. It's brought against the, the nation of Israel as a whole. The charges are brought against the the leaders of the people and also against the people themselves. Now, first of all, um, can I, I just, will you just do me a favor and will you take off your political hat for me, right? Just just put put aside your politics. I don't want you to be 
Republican or Democrat, red or blue. I don't want you to be conservative or liberal right now. But we cannot come to a text like this without acknowledging that God absolutely has throughout the scriptures brought charges against a nation that is turned from him. And in a nation like we face today, we have been so blessed through history to be a nation that called itself a Christian nation. But in the, the place that we stand today where we have, where we have uh, taken out prayer and we have taken out the word of God, where it started, the process started with, you know, oh, you can talk about God, but Jesus is just too confrontational. Right? That's, that's a little bit too much. God's fine. Jesus, no, nah, we're just going to leave that one on the side. To, to now where it's progressed, to even talking about the one true God is too confrontational to talk about. Right? We, can, we can talk all we want about um, Muhammad or Allah, and we can, we can put up all the, the Buddha statues and the, the Hindu statues and pictures in, um, in hair salons and nail salons and most yoga studios throughout the nation. But we can't talk about the things of God. That one's too confrontational. And what happens when you get that is you get a people that will be in moral decline, which is what we have seen in our nation. So can we just acknowledge that first? No matter what side of the line you're on, the reality is is that when you pull God out of anything, moral decline will follow. And so it's no wonder that the nation of Israel was facing charges. But it wasn't just the nation. Like he specifically identifies and calls out leaders in this text. It's the the leaders that are supposed to to lead the people into righteousness and to healthy living. And as soon as I say that, I know most of you are probably thinking, yes, those political leaders. And man, we should be praying for those leaders. Amen? 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 But it's not just political leaders. What about the leaders of the church? Over the last 10 years and more, but especially over the last 10 years, so many in the church have fought through the struggles of one leader after another falling. One leader after another crumbling under the pressure, falling to sin, whether it be um, marital infidelity, whether it be theft from churches. So Isaiah, through God, is bringing charges against leaders of the nation, leaders of the church. We see this throughout the scriptures, but here's what it boils down to. Here's what I'm coming to. You still with me? Here's what it comes down to. Most of these charges, most of what is talked about in this isn't so much just the nation or, um, or the, the government, the, the leaders of the nation. Most of what he's coming at is the people themselves. Listen to the charges that he brings. Right? My people have rebelled against me. They've, my children, the ones that I have created myself, they have rebelled against me. They don't know. They don't know me. They don't understand me. They, have, they are living lives of iniquity, meaning they are li- living lives of sin that is opposite of what I have called them to. There is great corruption and even the despising of God by being estranged. In other words, my people aren't even seeking me. They don't even, they don't know me. They're not seeking me. And it's no wonder that these charges are coming against them. It's kind of that that individual, okay, it's the the great, it's what the great theologian Michael Jackson said when he said, I'm looking at the man in the mirror. Right? Oh, come on. All of you know who that is. Now listen, I'm not putting him up there as a great role model, right? But it goes on to say, I'm asking him to change his ways. Who? Right? This is, the, this is what we're seeing as Isaiah is bringing these charges against the people. It's the people individually. Because when the people will live a changed life, When the people will rise up and say, I'm going to live in obedience to the king, the one true king. They live a changed life. That's what changes things. Because when people do that, the gospel goes out. Amen? The gospel goes out. The word of God goes out. And it's the word of God, the gospel, that changes everything. The book of Hebrews says that the word of God is living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. 
It's the word of God that changes lives, guys. And so we have to ourselves, my challenge to you is to take a deep look, to, to truly recognize what it is it in my life that is unhealthy. What's that pattern of sin that I turn to? Right? Before we can break the cycle, we must recognize the problem. Psalms 139, 23, and 24, it's King David writing, and he writes this. He says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. Let me stop there. David's not like, yeah, go ahead. Take a look at me. Search my heart. You'll find that it's clean and that there's nothing wrong in there. This is King David, the the one that God called a man after his own heart. And he goes on to say, and see if there be anything grievous in my, uh, any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. That's what this call is for us. It's a call for us to stop and evaluate what is it in my life that is just not matching up with the things of God what is this cycle that I keep turning to maybe for you it's that every time your kids disobey you you um, you get angry and when you get angry you lash out in yelling and you say words that cut and do more harm maybe it's maybe it's a memory that every time it comes up in your mind it triggers you and you turn to the bottle to numb it or you turn to entertainment you bury yourself in tv or music instead of seeking after the things of god maybe it's a relationship with your spouse where every time he's a jerk or you feel like he's a jerk you store it up and more and more you're distancing yourself from him or vice versa maybe it's your wife right What are these cycles in our life that we can recognize that we can get changed? And so the first thing that, if we're going to break the cycle, if we're going to be able to face these charges that that, uh, can be brought against us, the first thing that we have to do is we have to recognize that cycle. We have to recognize what it is in us that, um, that we can benefit from changing. Here's number two. Number two is realize the consequences. Okay? Um, Last week, we, uh, we went down to visit my son. We had our, our grandbaby for a few days, and so um, Gretchen and I drove down to, to drop him back off with the parents, right? By the way, um, being, a, being a grandparent is awesome, but when they're distance, you know, grandparents are supposed to be able to fill them up with sugar, wire them up, get them all crazy, and then send them back, but because we live so far away, we get them for like three, four days at a time. We don't get to do that, Right? But so like as I'm driving there, I'm like poking the kid and tickling him and trying to get him as worked up as I possibly can before I drop him off at his parents, right? So we take him, drop him off, and as soon as we bring him in, like he wasn't having it. He didn't want to be inside. So uh, my son grabs him. He's like, okay, let's go outside. So we go outside and uh, Walker, our grandbaby, he is a ball of energy. He's just running all over the place. Well, he wants to play on the driveway, And so he wants to play on the driveway, but the problem is my son, go figure, parked his truck in the driveway, right? So Walker gets super irritated, and he walks up, and he tries pushing the truck out of the driveway. It didn't go so well, as you can imagine. But then what happened, as often does, is he threw a tantrum, he got mad, and he hauled off and smacked the truck, right? smacked the license plate of the truck which bit him like it hurt and he pulled back and he looked at me with like teary eyes and you know the as always the compassionate grandpa that I am I went well you do dumb stuff dumb stuff happens (laughs) his mom laughed I realized immediately this 18 month old in front of me had no idea what I was talking about but we are not 18 month olds, right? All of us here can understand that choices have consequences. And as we read through the, the next part of that, what we see here is this plea for God for the, that they would not have to face consequences. Look at this in verse 5. It says, Why will you still be struck down? Walker, why do you keep punching the car? Stop it. Why will you be struck down? Why will you continue to rebel? 
The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot even to the head, there's no soundness in it. But bruises and sores and raw wounds, they're not pressed out or bound up or softened with oil. In other words, you guys are suffering and there's nothing to take care of it. Your country lies desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. In your very presence, foreigners devour your land. It is desolate as overthrown by foreigners. And the daughter of Zion is left like a, like a booth in a vineyard, like a lodge in a cucumber field, like a besieged city. In other words, it's not good. If the Lord of hosts had not left us a few survivors, we would have been like Sodom. We would have been like Gomorrah. For those of you who didn't grow up in the church, Sodom and Gomorrah were two cities that were packed full of evil, uh, idolatry, sexual sin, and they were destroyed by God with liter- like literally fire and brimstone. God destroyed them. And that would have been what it would have been like if the Lord of hosts had not left them a few survivors. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the teaching of our God, you people of Gomorrah. That's not nice, by the way. (laughs) Like sometimes God just says things that it just doesn't sound very nice. Like that's not a compliment that he's giving them. As a people, this is a problem. And he is letting them know, one, you don't have to be facing these consequences. These consequences are a result of your works of your life. But two, the consequences are coming. And so as we see through this, Hebrews 12, it says, For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. And there's a couple of different types of consequences. All of us know the consequences of do dumb stuff, dumb stuff happens, right? We've all had some choices that we wish we could take back. So... Um, you set your hand on the oven and the oven burns you. You've got blisters for the next few days. Consequences. But there are also consequences of sin that sometimes God will say, I love you so much that you're going to have to go through this until you come back to me. Until you come back to me and you once again remember the power of a life lived in my presence. I'm not saying every sickness Every heartache is a result of sin, but that doesn't mean that some aren't, right? Some are just consequences of our choices, but as we'll see, the promise that, is, that goes forward, Isaiah gives such a great hope for those who would recognize the struggle, recognize the, suc- the, the cycle, turn from the consequences. But before he goes into the, the part where he's going to give this great promise about restoration he stops and he gives God's heart about some of the ways that our problems can be solved so this text goes on it says this what to me is the multitude of your sacrifices says the Lord now you got to understand the Old Testament at this time people were still bringing animal sacrifices to the temple sacrificing them as coverage for their sin Right? Not complete forgiveness of sin because that wasn't possible with imperfect sacrifices. But they would bring these animals commanded by God as sacrifice to cover sin. But then God says, what to me is the multitude of your sacrifices? I have had enough of your burnt offerings of rams and the fat of well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required of you this trampling of my courts? Bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and the calling of convocations. I cannot endure iniquity and solemn assembly. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. Here's the third thing. The third thing is this. We need to resist fake religion. So many times we turn to our religious practices as a solution for the consequences that we're facing. 
And God, through Isaiah, just comes at the people, both barrels loaded, full force, and he's like, stop it! I hate your fake religion. I hate you living a life that has nothing to do with me during the week, but then coming on Sunday, okay, it wasn't Sunday, it was actually probably Saturday, coming on Saturday and bringing your sacrifices and coming like, like that's going to make it all better. I hate it. It's a burden to my soul. That's the, the cycle of sin that Israel was in. And it's no different for us today. So many, man, I can't tell you how I hate how easily I can fall into fake religion. Yes, how easily I can fall into fake religion. A pastor, it does happen. Sometimes I stand in these chairs and I call out loud and I sing the lyrics that are on the, the overhead because I know the songs, but yet in my head and my heart, I'm not thinking about glory to God. I'm probably thinking about what I'm going to say to you when I walk up here or what I have going on throughout the rest of the week. I come empty. I come with false and fake pretenses. Not to truly worship God, but, but instead just singing out. But it doesn't end there. There's days, there's whole weeks where I go through and my mind is so focused on my cycle. One of my cycles is my work, right? Getting caught up so much in work that I get so busy that I don't seek the things after God. And part of my reasoning for this series, part of my heart for you is I have seen so many times people who are living just existing when there's so much more for us guys there's so much more of just a life of existence where we go day to day just trying to get by where we suffer from anxiety and depression and the struggles of life because we're getting in this cycle where we're not truly drawing near to the one who created us and has the power to truly give us joy and happiness. Joy and happiness, anyone? A few of you? The rest of you? We need to talk, y'all. Right? There's so much available for those who will work to break the cycle, but we have to resist this fake religion where we just show up on Sunday or maybe a couple Sundays a month. But the rest of our days are not spent spreading the gospel. They're not spent um, drawing close to God and His Word and His prayer. They're not spent doing what James 1.27 says, which says that religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this. Show up on Sunday and give your money. Oh, wait, no, that's, that's not what it said. It says to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. In other words, it's actually to live a life as a Christ follower. That's what we are called to. All right, the last one, number four, is this. If you're with me, still say with you. All right. The last one has two R's in it. That's why I said there's five. It's repent and restoration. Repent and be restored. The text goes on as it finishes out through the rest of the chapter. It says, when you spread out your hands, I hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. But, here it goes. You ready for the bite? Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes, cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, plead the widow's cause. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, though your skins are bad, though your sins are bad. They shall be as white as snow. Though your sins are like scarlet, they sh this is a great place for an amen. They shall be as white as snow, meaning you will be washed clean of your sins. Whatever your sin, there is forgiveness available to you. And when you will turn and repent, there is forgiveness that a God who has created you, that you rebelled against, will still consider you righteous through his son, Jesus Christ. Whew. 
Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be eaten by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The promise of repentance and restoration is this great hope that Isaiah brings to the people. Now you need to understand, God flat out told Isaiah, the people are not going to respond. If y'all told me the people are not going to respond, I would be questioning my every being. But Isaiah, faithfully following the word of God, brings this charge to the people and he lays it out. Listen, the consequences are coming, but man, if you would just repent, you would be restored, you'd be redeemed, you will be refilled with the power and the presence of God. And that is the same promise that we have. Now, over the, the years, I have tried to teach you that repentance doesn't just mean like, um, I'm sorry, please forgive me, right? It's definitely not the, um, the little kid that their parent says, you know what, say you're sorry to your brother for stabbing him with a fork. And the kid's like, fine, sorry. That's definitely not repentance. And it's not even just a, you know what, that was wrong, I'm sorry. Repentance literally means I'm going in one direction in my life, in the choices that I'm making, and I'm then turning and going back towards God. But let me give you another way to think of this. We're talking about break the cycle, right? Break these cycles that are unhealthy, that are sinful in our life. And so let me, let me give you another version of this. Repentance is taking that cycle that you're breaking and it's replacing it with a new one. Does that make sense? It's not enough just to, just to try to remove on your own this struggle that you're facing, but the tool that you have is to replace it with a cycle that is godly and holy and according to the word of God. If you really want to make changes, you have an addiction, you have an addiction to entertainment, you have a an addiction to um, substances, you have an uh, addiction to gossip, you have an addiction to anger. If you really want to have victory, you identify what that is and you replace it with something that is healthy. You turn and you replace. That is what repentance means and that repentance leads us to a heart and a soul that is restored. And so many people, again, this is uh, my heart as we are going through this series. There's so many of you here that just have this heaviness and you just don't feel like God is close to you. You've told me. Like, I just don't hear God. I just don't feel God. I, like, I don't, I don't really know why he, he's not working in my life. The reason may be this very thing right here. It's this cycle of, man, I'm, by the way, I don't know about you, but every now and then I do tend to make some mistakes, right? Sin will come up in my life. The problem with Israel is that sin would build upon sin because that's what sin does. Sin leads to more sin, which leads to more sin and more sin and they would go for such long lengths of time before they would finally come back to the one who loves them, who can heal them, who can strengthen them, and say, man, I have sinned against you. Father, forgive me. Help me to replace this cycle of anger with self-control, with joy, with patience. Restore my soul. Without a soul that is restored, it's really hard not to have the joy and the happiness that God will provide for you. My heart is that you would have victory of you, that you would have victory over these things that just keep coming up in your life. And so as our worship team comes forward, I want to finish out with just a summary. What changes what charges could God bring against you and what's the best way to handle those charges first of all as you see on the overhead if you're taking notes 
repent, uh, recognize the cycle, sin. Rele- uh, realize the consequences. Resist fake religion as a fix of any kind. Repent and be restored. All right, I want to challenge you guys for something. How many of you are uh, process driven? How many of you are like, give me a good process and I'll succeed? That's it? Like seven of you? Okay. Then how many of you are creative? Like, don't stick me in a process. Let me just kind of do my own thing, and that's where I really flourish. All right, for those of you who are process-driven, you're going to love this. I want you this week, prayerfully, to write out your cycle. What is something that is always got a grip on you? Like, every time the temptation comes for this sin, I, I turn to this, I fall into it, it gets a hold of me. Maybe it's my anger. And so I'm going to recognize that when my child disobeys, I tend to get angry. Child disobeys, I get angry. And when I get angry, I get loud and I get hurtful because hurt people hurt people. And then the result of that, the consequences is that kind of drives a wedge between me and my child. So if you're process driven, you're going to love that process. You can do five of them, you can do ten of them. Some of you are holier than the rest of us, and you may have a hard time finding one, okay? Do the one. And for those of you who are creative, here's what I want you to do. Are you ready? I want you to do the same thing. Just deal with it. It's a process. But you can make it kind of pretty. Like, you can kind of, you know, draw some cool pictures or do it with some stencil or paint it. I don't, I don't care. But listen, let's take action on something. Guys, my heart is so much for us in this, that we would start to experience the love and joy, all of us, that comes from an an observed life, where we can say, yes, I do struggle with this. Yes, I am going to replace it with something else, and I do expect that God's word is true, and he's going to bless me for that. Are you with me? All right, I'd love to see him. You can bring him to me next week, okay? Send him to me in an email, but something practical. This is me trying to be pastor all of us all at once with something practical that we can take home that can change our life now and forever. And let's pray. Father, thank you for your blessings and your goodness. Thank you for your word. I pray, Lord, that our hearts are open through this series, that even today, even though today's a little different with an intro, that our people would seek you, that we would not be ones who have to receive the charge of being estranged from you because we're going through life without seeking you, Lord. Let that not be said of us. Father, grant that we would reach other people in North Iowa and across the world with the good news that your son has provided a means for us to be made white as snow. May the love in our hearts that come from you to reach out with the good news of your son, Jesus Christ. Pray this in your name.